We're about to do the mash. The monster mash. I know, not my best cold open. <laughs> Embarrassing. We're talking classic monsters at the horror movie syllabus. Hey everybody, welcome back to the horror movie syllabus. My name is Professor Victor, and as usual, I'll be your host as we discuss all of the essential, noteworthy, must-see, and, uh, and interesting horror films in modern horror. If you're new to the channel, you can find out more about the horror movie syllabus in our introduction video. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. But essentially what we do here is we pick three movies in a particular subgenre to discuss as the most noteworthy or essential or important films in that subgenre. Today's subgenre is classic monsters. And by classic monsters, what I'm referring to are what are commonly called the universal monsters. The monsters from the movies made by the Universal Studios in the 1930s and 40s, uh, and, and maybe later. Uh, specifically, we're talking about you know the ones that everybody knows. Dracula, Frankenstein, the mummy, the wolfman, creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, all, the, all the classic monsters. The ones that kids would have costumes of even today. Uh, and that's kind of the point of the classic monsters, is that they are kind of ubiquitous. Everybody knows them. They cross uh, generations. They cross nationalities. Um, genders, everything. Everybody knows the, the universal monsters. They've left an indelible mark on horror. And while those movies are out of scope for the horror movie syllabus, I may one day still do a video on them because they are, they are that important. They are that uh, significant and that influential in modern horror. Uh, but they are out of scope uh, from the horror movie syllabus, which starts from 1970s on. That said, there have been many modern takes on these classic monsters. So that's what we're going to look at today horror movies that did modern versions of the classic Universal Monsters. Now, as usual, the horror movie syllabus likes to rank these movies as undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate. And in this case, those rankings are going to be levels of quality, with undergraduate being the lowest quality and postgraduate being the highest quality movie. With that said, let's just go ahead and get right into the movies. The first movie we're talking about today is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein came out in 1994, directed by Kenneth Branagh, and that's somewhat noteworthy because at the time, Kenneth Branagh is known as the Shakespearean guy. He's the guy who does modern versions of Shakespeare. And so when he gets this movie, it becomes something of a Shakespearean type story or a Shakespearean epic. And that's a large part why it didn't get very well received, I think. The movie was not a big hit, um, and it's a shame because the movie is rather true to the book, or more true to the book than any other version of Frankenstein that I'm familiar with. For those of you that don't know, the story goes that uh, Victor Frankenstein is something of a, of a mad scientist who decides he can try to create life by using or reanimating dead body parts. He assembles together a creature and brings it to life. The creature... Uh, kind of goes on a rampage and uh, eventually winds up getting destroyed by townspeople and, and lynched. Um, uh, well, that's at least the the universal monster movie version of the story. The book's a little bit more nuanced in the sense that uh, Victor Frankenstein is uh, less of a mad scientist and more of somebody who's trying to uh, achieve what only God has achieved in the past in terms of creating life, and he has motivations for that. And the creature is not really a monster like he's portrayed in the Universal Monster movies, but rather uh, a new being, a new f created life that's trying to learn and and adjust and figure out how to deal with its emotions and feelings and, and winds up hurting people and hurting things because it doesn't know any better. It's just a big, strong baby, if you will. And this movie does a good job of capturing that. Uh, it, uh, unlike other movies that have just kind of treated Frankenstein's creature as, as a monster, this movie actually treats him as a character. And it casts Robert De Niro playing the monster, who does a, a rather good performance. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Robert De Niro uh, in later days, and kind of like, uh, I'm a monster and I'm going to get you. Like, that's not what's happening here. Um, I, by the way, worst De Niro impression ever. I, I understand. Um, but that's not what's happening here. De Niro's actually giving a more nuanced performance than you might think of him as giving, uh, especially if you're not familiar with his early work. Uh, he's good in this movie. The script is a little um, 
I shouldn't say the script. The script is actually pretty good. Uh, it's written by Frank Darabont, who did uh, uh, Shawshank Redemption, and he did Early Walking Dead. He's a great writer. It's just that uh, Kenneth Branagh is, again, known for making Shakespearean movies, so it kind of seems uh, epic, or I think the word that I've seen other, other people use is operatic, and that's probably a pretty good word for it. As a result, uh, some of the dialogue kind of comes off a little bit hokey when it really probably shouldn't have. But again, I don't really blame De Niro for that. It's really probably Brana's fault. But that said, I think Brana directs this movie rather well. It's a big movie. It's maybe a little bit too big. Uh, I think it could use a little bit of trimming. But it looks gorgeous. It's really a beautiful film. Uh, and it's it's kind of... I think it kind of achieves some of the epicness that it's trying to achieve. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting about it is Kenneth Branagh plays Victor Frankenstein. Um, and Branagh has a reputation for being a little bit full of himself. Um, I, I love Kenneth Branagh, but that's kind of true. Um, but uh, as a result, Victor Frankenstein, who's usually perceived as the villain in most versions of the story, doesn't come off quite so villainous here. He really humanizes him in a way that, I wouldn't go so far as to say he makes him the hero, but he somewhat absolves him of his sins by giving him motivations that are somewhat noble or at least understandable. And at the same time, the creature is uh, also absolved of a lot of its wrongdoing because it's kind of shown as like an innocent who's kind of getting pushed to do things wrong um, and, and eventually kind of gets uh, into a vengeful rage. Um, and it works for me. I, I like the fact that the movie gets a little bit... Um, muddy in terms of who's the protagonist and who's the antagonist uh, and ultimately kind of decides that uh, neither of the two are perfectly right or perfectly wrong. I like that. I like that ambiguity. I like that messiness and that kind of um, not clean, not black and white aspect of the film. But I think that's another reason why uh, many fans didn't gravitate towards this one when it came out. I know that it's gotten a little bit more of a cult following in the years since. I'm one of the people that are into that. Uh, although I liked it when it came out. Um, and I understand, again, why people don't like it and why a lot of people still don't like it. It could be better. It could be fixed. But there are a lot of things that I think went well in this movie that I don't think it gets enough credit for. Uh, and I definitely think that you should check it out and make up your own mind of whether or not you think it works or how much you think it works. And give us your opinions in the comments below. But this is why we picked it for our, our representation of the Universal Classic Monsters in a modern setting because it's really well made. Uh, it's, it's well acted. Helena Bottom Carter, we didn't even talk about her, but she's excellent in it. It's definitely um, a, a one to watch and, and give it more credit than it's been given in the past. Our second movie that we're talking about today in Classic Monsters is The Wolfman. Now, The Wolfman came out in 2010, uh, and that may be a little bit of its problem because if there's something that's a bad thing or a problem in this movie, it's the CGI, the computer-generated graphics. Um, they aren't great. Um, the wolf transformations in particular, they're not, they're not fantastic. And they weren't even fantastic at the time. It's not that they've aged poorly. It's that they're just not that good. They were never that good. But outside of that, I think this movie's fantastic. And I'm maybe a little bit in the minority on this one. It's another one that really was a bit of a box office flop, got critically maligned, and I don't know why. It's a gothic but modern retelling of the classic Universal Monster story of the Wolfman. Uh, if you don't know about that movie, it's a you know, pretty simple uh, man gets bit by a wolf and turns into a werewolf. Um, you know, it's, there's not a whole lot to it, but... Uh, the movie does a really good job of humanizing the character uh, who's played by Benicio Del Toro so that when he starts to struggle with his wolfness or his, his werewolf curse, you feel it. You care about it. Uh, the acting is really good across the board. You've got Anthony Hopkins in there as, a, as Benicio's dad chewing up scenery, just uh, big and, 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 and gregarious and, and, and great. He works in the movie very well. And Emily Blunt centers the movie. She grounds it, uh, being the love interest for uh, for Lawrence Talbot, who's uh, the, the character that Benicio plays. And it's also just beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's it's really well shot, and it just looks great. The The set design, the production is is just wonderful. It really captures like that old universal monster feel. And for the life of me, I can't understand why people didn't gravitate towards it more. I... 
I don't know what it was that people wanted from it. It really is a modern version of the classic Universal Monster movie. It's very true to that source material in both look and story. And it's just, you know, if you don't like old films from the 1930s and 40s, if you don't like black and white films, if you don't like the pacing and, and the acting and, and, and stuff like that from old movies like that, then this movie should have been the remedy for that. It really is just like a modern sensibility or modern filmmaking sensibility with a classic story. And I can't understand why people didn't love it because I loved it. I loved it at the time. And then I rewatched it again recently before making this video because I was like, well, maybe I just loved it at the time and it really, I, if I look at it with fresh eyes, I'll see the flaws in it. Nope, nope. I rewatched it and I just think it's great. It's really, really good. And I don't understand other than the CGI why people dislike it because the CGI, especially at the end, I can't defend it. I can't defend that CGI. It, it's it's kind of like the CGI at the end of Black Panther. There's no excuse for it. Um, it's just bad. Uh, if they had gone practical, I think this movie would have been an instant classic. As it stands, I think it's a modern classic. That's why I've chosen it here. Um, if you have a different opinion, by all means, share it in the comments below. I'd like to hear it, but I'm saying that The Wolfman is an excellent modern representation of a classic universal monster. Definitely check it out. Let me know what you think. Uh, I love this movie. I think it's underrated, and I think it deserves a fairer shake than it's got. And the final movie that we're talking today in Classic Monsters is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Now, this movie came out in 1992, uh, and I was in high school at the time. And I had just been in the school play, which was a theatrical production of Dracula. Uh, in case you're wondering, I played Abraham Van Helsing. And in case you're also wondering, uh, yeah, I was a slight theater nerd, but not a total theater nerd. So, there you go. Uh, this movie came out shortly after that we had done that play, and... Uh, we all saw it together as a cast. Opening night, we all went together. And this movie blew me away. Uh, it's so good. It's beautiful. It just looks so lush and stylish. And the imagery is just captivating. And the imagery is, is creepy when it should be creepy and gorgeous when it should be gorgeous. Uh, the cinematography is just lush and beautiful and rich. And the, the performances, by and large, are just wonderful with uh, one notable exception that we'll get to in a minute i remember not everybody felt this way about it it kind of had a mixed reaction if i recall correctly uh in part because i think people were expecting the classic universal monster dracula the bella lugosi i've gone through suck your blood and you know the cape and <clears throat> the slick back hair and the widow's peak and all that stuff and and francis ford coppola the director of this movie did away with all of that and, and gave a not a modern take. It wasn't a modern film. It was still set uh, in time period appropriate, but a different take on the character. Uh, and Gary Oldman's take on Dracula has become an iconic version uh, of the version of Dracula. Um, maybe not quite as well known and iconic as Bela Lugosi uh, from the Universal movies, but pretty darn close. He did something fresh and original with that character that is so wonderfully over-the-top creepy and unsettling and unique and memorable and I absolutely love it. I love it when he's creepy withered Dracula. I love it when he's sexy handsome uh, man about town Dracula. Gary Oldman crushes it in this movie like he does in pretty much everything he does. Um, Winona Ryder as his love interest is uh, I think good. I know some people think she's terrible in the movie. I think the accent's a little bit shaky. Uh, I, I'm a Winona Ryder apologist. She's one of my favorite actors from the 90s. I, I, I love her, and I love her in this movie, so there's that. Van Helsing's played by Anthony Hopkins. Uh, again, kind of chewing up scenery in this and working really well. I, I again, was Van Helsing in the play version, uh, so I was kind of particular to Anthony Hopkins in this movie. Uh, the one weak link in the movie is Keanu Reeves. Um, and we haven't really talked about Keanu Reeves yet on the channel. I'm a big Keanu Reeves fan. I love him to death. But there are three categories of Keanu Reeves films. There's movies that he's terrible in and it kind of ruins the movie. There's movies that he's not particularly good in, but it doesn't really ruin the movie. The movie's still good. And then there's movies that he's genuinely good in, although it's a, it's a, that's a small category. This movie kind of falls in the first category. I don't think the movie's ruined by, by, by Keanu's performance. But it's close, man. He, He's really struggling in this movie. He is out of his depth. He is miscast in this movie. He looks uncomfortable in this movie. 
his accent is atrocious. He's just not good in this movie to the point where it's hysterical and almost distracting and it almost derails the movie for me. Um, and I think it does derail the movie for other people. But for me, it's not enough to ruin it. The movie has far too many good things going on to let that one bad thing kind of ruin it. And again, I, I have love for Keanu, so I can kind of just like laugh it off a little bit. But he is bad in it. Uh, uh, and if you haven't seen it before and you watch it, you'll, you'll see. There's there's no redeeming it. He's he's he, It's a rough performance, man. Uh, but overall, acting is good. The movie is gorgeous, directed really well. The story's cool. It's got just enough gore and horror in it to, to be uh, satisfying to the horror fans. But enough romance in it that, that those of you that like the romance movies and the period dramas will be into it too. Costumes are fantastic. I can't praise it enough i rewatched this one again recently maybe i don't know a few months ago and it holds up man i absolutely love it i think that it's uh, a really wonderful well-made movie that maybe maybe doesn't go quite as far as it could go but goes far enough that compared to the 1930s original definitely feels like a more modern take it feels like a much more edgy take i'm sure that uh there are other dracula takes that are much more modern or more edgy but this one is a really sweet balance right in that sweet spot about uh honoring the original source material but giving a modern take a modern sensibility and a modern edge to it highest of recommends for D the bram stoker dracula uh definitely love this movie and definitely think you should see it uh, everybody should see this movie it's a quintessential horror film uh and if you're looking for uh, a representative dracula film this is the one you want to see So that's going to do it for our three picks for noteworthy modern versions of the classic monsters. However, as some of you know, we like to give a few extra credit films for those of you that like this particular subgenre and looking uh, for a few more recommendations. The first one I'm going to mention is Dracula Untold, which came out a few years ago and was one of the early attempts for Universal to reboot their classic monsters as something of a shared universe. And it didn't really work out so well because the movie didn't do very well. It starred Luke Evans as Dracula, and he's great in the role in the movie doesn't it doesn't achieve the bram stoker dracula version of uh beautiful lush cinematography and imagery but it's not bad it's a little heavy with the cgi and not the best cgi in the world but i liked this take i think it's an underrated movie i kind of wish that it had successfully launched the universal monster take i would have liked to have seen more movies in this universe unfortunately they didn't carry on with it but if you haven't seen it, give it a chance. Uh, it wasn't successful. A lot of people didn't like it, but I stand by it. I think it's a pretty good movie. So check it out if you haven't already. Uh, give it a chance and, and tell me what you think of it. The next movie I'm going to recommend is called The Bride. And The Bride was a 80s film that was a modern take on The Bride of Frankenstein, another universal classic monster film. The movie's mostly remembered for having rock musician Sting in it as Dr. Frankenstein. And he's good in the movie. And the movie is good. It's kind of a gothic romance tale. And uh, it's not... It's not a classic. It's not a must-see movie. I remember getting a lot of buzz at the time it came out, but it hasn't really gone down in history as one of those quintessential movies, hence why it didn't actually make the syllabus. But I'm recommending it here as extra credit because it is good. It's a cool take on the matter. Uh, and if you like Sting, you should definitely check it out. And I do. I like Sting. Um, or at least I like early Sting. Later Sting, not so much. But this is not a video about music. This is a video about horror movies. So The Bride, a good horror movie. I would say check it out. Um... Again, Manager Expectations is not amazing, but it's good. It's worth a watch. And if you're liking uh, modern takes on these universal classic monsters, this is one you should definitely check out. And the last extra credit movie that I'll mention is Hollow Man. Now, Hollow Man stars Kevin Bacon as the uh, as the Invisible Man. It's not really a, a modern retelling of the Universal movie uh, with the Invisible Man. It's really just a, a, a new movie or a modern movie with the same concept of a man who can turn invisible or turns invisible and how he kind of loses his mind and loses his morals. Uh, and I like that aspect of it. I like that they really delved into the uh, the immorality of somebody who isn't seen and how they start doing things or acting in ways that they wouldn't have normally acted if people could see them. That was a cool idea. That said, it gets a little bit sleazy in a way that I think is uncomfortable for some viewers. So um, trigger warning, I guess, on, on some of that. But I think that that's actually something that is worth looking at because I think that that is... Uh, something that a lot of guys who turned invisible might actually start doing. Uh, so, and, and I think that's actually true to the original Invisible Man character from the from the Universal series because that was kind of what happened with him too. Not not to that sleazy degree, but his morality kind of went out the window. And and so I like that aspect of it. I like that 
it takes the themes from the original uh, Universal movie and and explores those a little bit more in depth in a way that is a little bit more modern. Plus, the special effects, I think, hold up fairly well in that movie. So definitely check out Hollow Man. Let me know what you think of that one as well. So that's all the extra credit movies we're going to mention. Uh, if you are expecting to see a movie in this uh, subgenre, in this video, that you didn't see, there's a chance that maybe it pops up in another category in the horror movie syllabus. For example, the most recent version of The, the Invisible Man that came out in 2020 that starred Elizabeth Moss is definitely popping up somewhere else in the horror movie syllabus. And there's some other movies that you might have thought could have popped up or qualified in this video uh, that'll pop up in other areas in the horror movie syllabus. But go ahead and let us know down in the comments below what other movies you would have thought should have been included in this video for this subgenre. I'm interested in seeing what you guys came up with. That's going to do it for this subgenre of horror. As usual, thank you guys very much for your attendance, and class dismissed.